All right, guys, it's been more than half a year. Uh, and as you can see, my appearance is much different from the uh, last time we were reading, but it's OK. We are continuing off. We're still on page 43 of Small Gods. But uh, yeah, let's get some reading done today. <clears throat> From prayer towers up and down the contours of the citadel, the deacons chanted the duties of the hour. Brutha should have been in class, but the Tudor priests weren't too strict with him. After all, he had arrived word perfect uh, in every book of the Septuich and knew all the prayers and hymns off by heart, thanks to his grandmother. They probably assumed he was being useful, useful doing something no one else wanted to do. He held the bean rose for the look of the thing. The great god Om, although currently the small god Om, ate a lettuce leaf. All my life, Brutha thought, I've known that the great god Om, he made the holy horn sign in a fairly half-hearted way, was a, a, a great big beard in the sky, or sometimes when he comes down into the world, a huge bull or lion or something big anyway, something you could look up to. Somehow a tortoise isn't the same. I'm trying hard, but it isn't the same. And hearing him talk about the Septarchs as if they were just, just some mad old men, it's like a dream. In the rainforest of Brutha's subconscious, the butterfly of doubt emerged and flapsed an experimental wing, all unaware of what chaos theory has to say about this sort of thing. I feel a lot better now, said the tortoise, better than I have for months. Months, said Brutha, how long have you been ill? The tortoise put its foot on a leaf. Oh, what day is it? It said. Tenth of Groon, said Brutha. Yes, that. Uh, what year? Uh, notional serpent. What do you mean, what year? Then three years, said the tortoise. This is good lettuce, and it's me saying it. You don't get lettuce up in the hills. Better plantain, a thorn bush or two. Let there be another leaf. Brutha pulled one off the nearest plant, and lo, he thought, there was another leaf. And you were going to be a bull? Opened my eyes, my eye, and I was a tortoise. Why? How should I know? I don't know, lied the tortoise. But you're omnicognizant, said Brutha. That, that doesn't mean I know everything. Brutha bit his lip. Uh, yes, it does. You sure? Yes. I thought that was omnipotent. No, that means you're all powerful. And you are. Well, that's what it says in the Book of Ossery. Uh, he was one of the great prophets, you know. I hope, Brutha added. Who told him I was omnipotent? You did. No, I didn't. Well, he said you did. Don't even remember anyone called Ossery, the tortoise muttered. You spoke to him in the desert, said Brutha. You must remember, he was eight feet tall, with a very long beard and a huge staff, and the glow of the holy horn shining off of his head. He hesitated. But he'd seen the statues of the holy icons. They couldn't be wrong. Never met anyone like that, said the small god Om. Maybe he was a bit shorter, Brutha conceded. Ossery, ossery, said the tortoise. No, no, can't say I. He said you spoke unto him from out of a pillar of flame, said Brutha. Oh, that ossery, said the tortoise. Pillar of flame, yes. And you dictated to him the book of ossery, said Brutha, which contains the directions, the gateways, the abjurations, and the precepts. 193 chapters. I don't think I did all that, said Om doubtfully. I'm sure I would have remembered 193 chapters. What did you say to him then? As far as I can remember, it was, hey, see what I can do, said the tortoise. Brutha stared at it. It looked embarrassed, insofar as that's possible for a tortoise. Even gods like to relax, it said. Hundreds of thousands of people live their lives by the abjurations of, and the precepts, Brutha snarled. Well, I'm not stopping them, said Om. If you didn't dictate them, who did? Don't ask me. I'm not omnicognizant. Brutha was shaking with anger. The, and the prophet abbeys? I suppose someone just happened to give them the codicils, did they? It wasn't me. They were, they're written on slabs of lead ten feet tall. Oh, well, it must have been me, yes? I always have a ton of lead slabs around in case I meet someone in the desert, yes? What? If you didn't give them to him, who did? I don't know. Why should I know? I can't be everywhere at once. You're omnipresent. Who says so? The prophet Hashimi. Never met the man. Oh? Oh, I suppose you didn't give him the book of creation then? Uh, what book of creation? You mean you don't know? No! Then who gave it to him? I don't know. Perhaps he wrote it himself. 
Brutha put his hand over his mouth in horror. That's blasphemy! What? Brutha removed his hand. I said that's blasphemy! Blasphemy? How can I blaspheme? I'm a god! I don't believe you. Ha! Want another thunderbolt? You call that a thunderbolt? Brutha was red in the face and shaking. The tortoise hung its head sadly. All right, all right, not much of one, I admit, it said. If I was better, you'd have been just a pair of smoke er, sandals with smoke coming out. It looked wretched. I don't understand it. This sort of thing has never happened to me before. I intended to be a great big roaring white bull for a week and ended up a tortoise for three years. Why? I don't know. Now I'm supposed to know everything. According to these prophets of yours who say they've met me anyway. You know, no one even heard me. I tried talking to goat herds and stuff, and they never took any notice. I was beginning to think I was a tortoise dreaming about being a god. That's how bad it was getting. Hmm. Perhaps you are, said Brutha. Your legs swell to tree trunks, snapped the tortoise. But, but, said Brutha, you're saying the prophets were just men who wrote things down. That's what they were. Yes, but it wasn't from you. Some of it was, perhaps, said the tortoise. I've forgotten so much already in the past few years. But if you've been down here as a tortoise, who's been listening to the prayers? Who's been accepting the sacrifices? Who's been judging the dead? I don't know, said the tortoise. Who did it before? You did. Did I? Brutha stuck his fingers in his ears and opened up with a third verse of Lo, the infidels flee the wrath of Alm. After a couple of minutes, the tortoise stuck its head out from under its shell. So, it said, before unbelievers get burned alive, do you sing to them first? No! Ah, a merciful death. Can I say something? If you try to tempt my faith one more time... The tortoise paused. Ohm searched his fading memory. Then he scratched in the dust with a claw. I remember a day, summer day, you were 13. The dry little voice droned on. Brutha's mouth formed a slowly widening O. Finally, he said... How did you know that? You believe in the great god Ohm watches everyone, you, or everything you do, don't you? You're a tortoise. You couldn't have. When you were almost 14 and your grandmother had beaten you for stealing cream from the still room, when in fact you had not done, she locked you in your room and you said, I wish you were... Next paragraph. There will be a sign, thought Vorbis. There will always be a sign. For the man who watched them... Or what, for the man who watched for them. A wise man always put himself in the path of God. He strolled through the citadel. He always made a point of taking a daily walk through some of the lower levels, although, of course, at, di at a different time and via a different route. Insofar as Vorbis got any pleasure in life, at least in any way that could be recognized by a normal human being, it was seen the faces of humble members of the clergy as they rounded a corner and found themselves face to chin with Deacon Vorbis of the Quisition. There was always that little intake of breath that indicated a guilty conscience. Vorbis liked to see properly guilty consciences. That was what consciences were for. Guilt was the grease in which the wheels of the authority turned. He rounded a corner and saw, scratched crudely on the wall opposite, a rough oval with four crude legs and even cruder head and tail. He smiled. There seemed to be more of them lately. Let here see fester. Let it come to the surface like a boil. Vorbis knew how to wield the lance. But the second or two of reflection had made him walk past a turning and, and instead, he stepped out into the sunshine. He was momentarily lost for all his knowledge of the byways of the church. This was one of the walled gardens. Around a fine stand of tall decorative clachian corn, bean vines raised red and white blossoms towards the sun, in between the bean rows, melons baked gently on the dusty soil. In the normal way, Vorbis would have noted and approved of this efficient use of space, but in the normal way, he wouldn't have encountered a plump young novice rolling head back and forth in the dust with fingers in his ears. Vorbis stared down at him. Then he prodded Brutha with his sandal. What ails you, my son? Brutha opened his eyes. There weren't very, there weren't many superior members of the hierarchy he could recognize. Even the Cenobi Arch was a distant blob in the crowd but everyone recognized Vorbis the Exquisitor. Something about him projected itself on your conscience within a few days of your arrival on the Citadel. The god was merely to be feared in perfunctory ways of habit, but Vorbis was dreaded. Brutha fainted. 
Oh, very strange, said Vorbis. A hissing noise made him look around. There was a small tortoise near his foot. As he glared, it tried to back away, and all the time it was staring at him and hissing like a kettle. He picked it up and examined it carefully, turning it over and over in his hands. Then he looked around in the walled garden until he found a spot full of sunshine and put the reptile down on its back. After a moment's thought, he took a couple of pebbles from one of the vegetable beds and wedged them under the shell so the creature's movement wouldn't tip it over. Vorbis believed that no opportunity to acquire esoteric knowledge should ever be lost, and made a mental note to come back every few hours to see how it was getting on, if work permitted. He turned his attention to Brutha. There was a hell for blasphemers. There was a hell for the disputers of rightful authority. There were a number of hells for liars. There was probably a hell for little boys who wished their grandmothers were dead. There were more than enough hells to go around. This was the definition of eternity. It was the space of time devised by the great god Om to ensure that everyone got the punishment that was due to them. The Omnians had a great many hells. Currently, Brutha was going through all of them. Brother Numrod and Brother Vorbis looked down at him, tossing and turning on his bed like a beached whale. It's the sun, said Numrod, almost calm after the initial shock of having the Exquisitor come looking for him. Uh, the poor lad works all day in the garden. It was bound to happen. Have you tried beating him? said Brother Vorbis. I'm sorry to say that beating young Brutha is like trying to flog a mattress, said Numrod. He says ow, but I think it's only because he wants to show he's willing. Very willing lad, Brutha. He's the one I told you about. He doesn't look very sharp, said Vorbis. He's not, said Numrod. Vorbis nodded approvingly. Undue intelligence in a novice was a mixed blessing. Sometimes it could be channeled for greater glory of Om, but often it caused, well, it did not cause trouble, because Vorbis knew exactly what to do with misapplied intelligence, but it did cause some unnecessary work. And yet you tell me his tutor speaks so highly of him, he said. Numrod shrugged. He's very obedient, he said. And, well, there's his memory. What about his memory? There's so much of it, said Numrod. He has got a good memory? Good is the wrong word. It's superb. He's word perfect on the entire sep- Hmm? said Vorbis. Numrod caught the deacon's eye. As perfect, uh, that is, as anything may be in this most imperfect world, he muttered. A devoutly read young man, said Vorbis. Ah, uh, said Numrod. No, he can't read or write. Uh -huh. A lazy boy. The deacon was not a man who dwelt in gray areas. Numrod's mouth opened and shut silently as he sought for proper words. Uh, no, he said. He tries. We're sure he tries. He just does not seem to be able to make the... He can't fathom the link between sounds and the letters. You have beaten him for that, at least? It seems to have little effect, Deacon. How, then, has he become such a capable pupil? He listens, said Numrod. No one listened quite like Brutha. He reflected. It made it very hard to teach him. It was like... It was like being in a great big cave. All of your words just vanished into the unfillable depths of Brutha's head. The sheer concentrated absorption could reduce the unwary tutors to stuttering silence as every word they uttered whirled away into Brutha's ears. He listens to everything, said Numrod, and he watches everything. He takes it all in. Vorbis stared down at Brutha, and I've never heard him say an unkind word, said Numrod. The other novices make fun of him sometimes. Call him the big dumb ox. Yeah, you know the sort of thing. Vorbis took it in Brutha's ham-sized hands and tree trunk legs. He appeared to be thinking deeply. Cannot read and write, said Vorbis, but extremely loyal, you say. Loyal and devout, said Numrod. And a good memory, Vorbis murmured. It's more than that, said Numrod. It's not like memory at all. Vorbis appeared to reach a decision. Send him to see me when he is recovered, he said. Numrod looked panicky. I merely wish to talk to him, said Vorbis. I may have a use for him. Y yes, Lord? For I suspect the great god Ohm moves in mysterious ways. High above, no sound but the hiss of wind and feathers. The eagle stood on the breeze looking down at the toy buildings on the citadel. It had dropped somewhere and now it couldn't find it. Somewhere down there in that little patch of green.
Bees buzzed in the bean blossoms, and the sun beat down on the upturned shell of Ohm. There is also a hell for tortoises. He was too tired to waggle his legs now. That was all you could do, waggle your legs, and stick your head out as far as it would go and wave it about in the hope that you could lever yourself over. You died if you had no believers, and that was also what a small god generally worried about. But you also died if you died. In the part of his mind not occupied with the thoughts of heat, he could feel Brutha's terror and bewilderment. He shouldn't have done that to the boy. Of course he hadn't been watching him. What god did that? Who cared what people did? Belief was the thing. He'd just picked the memory out of the boy's mind to impress, like a conjurer removing an egg from someone's ear. I'm on my back and it's getting hotter and I'm going to die. And yet, and yet, that bloody eagle had dropped him on a compost heap. Some kind of clown, that eagle. Whole place built a rock on rock in a rocky place and he landed on the one thing that'd break his fall without breaking him as well. And really close to a believer. Odd that. Makes you wonder if it wasn't some kind of divine providence, except that you were divine providence, on your back, getting hotter, preparing to die. That man who had turned him over, that expression on that mild face, he'd remember that. That expression, not of cruelty, but of some different level of being. That expression of terrible peace. A shadow crossed the sun. Om um squinted up into the face of Lut Z, who gazed at him with a gentle, upside-down compassion. And then he turned him the right way up, and then he picked up his broom and wandered off, without a second glance. Om um sagged, catching his breath, and then brightened up. Someone here likes me, he thought, and it's me. Sergeant Simony waited until he was back in his own quarters before he unfolded his own scrap of paper. He was not at all surprised to find it marked with a small drawing of a turtle. He was the lucky one. He'd lived for a moment like this. Someone had to bring back the writer of the truth to be a symbol for the movement. It had to be him. The only shame was that he couldn't kill Vorbis. But that had to happen where it could be seen. One day, in front of the temple, otherwise no one would believe. Alm stumped along a sandy corridor. He'd hung around a while after Brutha's disappearance. Hanging around is another thing tortoises are very good at. They're practically world champions. Bloody useless boy, he thought. Served himself right for trying to talk to a barely coherent novice. Of course, the skinny old one hadn't been able to hear him, nor had the chef. Well, the old one was probably deaf. As for the cook, Om made a note that when he was restored to his full godly powers, a special fate was going to lie in wait for the cook. He wasn't sure exactly what it was going to be, but it was going to involve boiling water and probably carrots would come into it somewhere. He enjoyed the thought for a moment. But where did it leave him? It left him in this wretched garden, as a tortoise. He knew how they'd got in. He glared in dull terror at the tiny dot in the sky, and the memory... I have memory knew was an eagle. And he'd better find a more terrestrial way out, unless he wanted to spend the next month hiding under melon leaf. Another thought struck him. Good eating! When he had his powers again, he was going to spend quite some time devising a few new hells. And a couple fresh precepts, too. Thou shalt not eat of the meat of the turtle. That was a good one. He was surprised he hadn't thought of it before. Perspective. That's what it was. And if he'd liked one of those thou shalt bloody well pick up any distressed tortoises and carry them anywhere they want unless, and this is important, you're an eagle a few years ago, he wouldn't be in this trouble now. Nothing else for it. He'd have to find Cenobiarch himself. Someone like a high priest would be bound to be able to hear him and he'd be in this place somewhere high priest tended to stay put should be easy enough to find and while he might currently be a tortoise almost still a god how hard could it be he'd have to go upwards that's what a hierarchy meant you found the man the top man by going upwards wobbling slightly his cell jerking from side to side the former great god ohm set off to explore the citadel erected to his greater glory he couldn't help noticing things had changed a lot in 3,000 years. M me, said Brutha, but, but I don't believe he means to punish you, said Numrod. Although punishment is what you richly deserve, of course. We all richly deserve, he added piously. But why? Why? He said nothing. He just wants to talk to you. But there's nothing I could possibly say that a quiz Quisitor wants to hear, said Brutha. Here, 
I'm sure you're not questioning the deacon's wishes, said Numrod. No, 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 uh, of course not, said Brutha. He hung up his head. Good boy, said Numrod. He patted as far up Brutha's back as he could reach. Mm, just you trot along, he said. I'm sure everything will be all right. And then, because he had too been brought up in habits of honesty, he added, mm, probably all right. There were few steps in the citadel. The progress of the many professions had marked the complex rituals of the great god Ohm, demanding long, gentle slopes. Such steps as there were, they were low enough to encompass the faltering steps of very old men. And there were so many very old men in the citadel. Sand blew in all the time from the desert. Drifts built up on the steps uh, and in the courtyards, despite everything that an army of brush-wielding novices could do. But a tortoise has very inefficient legs. Thou shall build shallower steps, he hissed, hauling himself up. Feet thundered past him a few inches away. This was one of the main thoroughfares of the citadel, leading to the Place of Lamentation, and was trodden by thousands of pilgrims every day. Once or twice an errant sandal caught his shell and spun him around. Your feet fly from your body and be buried in a termite mound, he screamed. It made him feel a little better. Another foot clipped him and... Slid, across the slid him across the stones. He fetched up with a clang against a curved metal grill set low on the wall. Only a lightning grab with his jaw stopped him from slipping through it. He ended up hanging by his mouth over a cellar. A tortoise has incredibly powerful jaw muscles. He swayed a bit, legs wobbling. All right, tortoise in a crevasse. Rocky landscape was used to this sort of thing. He just had to get his leg hooked. Faint sounds drew themselves to his attention. There was a clink of metal and then a very soft whimper. Alm swiveled his eye around. The grill was high in one, of, in, uh, in one wall of a very long, very low room. It was brightly illuminated by the light wells that ran everywhere through the citadel. Vorbis had made a point of that. The Inquisitors shouldn't work in the shadows, he said, but in the light, where they could see very clearly what they were doing. So could Alm. He hung from the grill for some time, unable to take his eye off of the row of benches. On the whole, Vorbis discouraged red-hot iron, spike chains, and things with drills and big screws on, unless it was for public display on an important fast day. It was amazing what you could do, he had always said, with a simple knife. But many of the Inquisitors liked the old ways best. After a while, Ohm very slowly hauled himself onto the grill, neck mi muscles twitching. Like a creature with its mind on something else, the tortoise hooked first one leg over the bar and then another. His back legs waggled for a while and then he hooked a claw onto the rough stonework. He strained for a moment and then pulled himself back into the light. He walked off slowly, keeping close to the wall to avoid the feet. He had no alternative to walking slowly in any case, but now he is walking slowly because he was thinking. Most gods find it hard to walk and think at the same time. Anyone could go to the Place of Lamentation. It was one of the great freedoms of Omnianism. There were all sorts of ways to petition the Great God, but they all depended largely on how much you could afford, which was right and proper in exactly how should things should be. After all, those who had achieved success in the world clearly had done it with the approval of the Great God, because it was impossible to believe that they had managed it with his disapproval. In the same way, the Quisition could act without possibility of flaw. Suspicion was proof. How could it be anything else? The great god would not have seen fit to put this suspicion in the minds of his exquisitors unless it was right that it should be there. Life could be very simple, if you believed in the great god Om, and sometimes quite short, too. But there were always the improvident, the stupid, and those who, because of some flaw or oversight in their life or a past one, were not even able to afford a pinch of incense. And the great God in his wisdom and mercy as filtered through his peace had made provision for them. Prayers and entreaties could be offered up in the place of lamentation. They would assuredly be heard. They might even be heeded. Behind the place there was a square 200 meter across rose the great temple itself. There, without a shadow of a doubt, the God listened. Or somewhere close, anyway. Thousands of pilgrims visited the place every day. A heel knocked Ohm's shell, bouncing him off the wall. On the rebound, a crutch caught him on the edge of his carapace and whirled him away into the crowd, spinning like a coin. He bounced up against the bedroll of an old woman who, like many others, reckoned that the efficacy of her petition was increased by
by the amount of time she spent on the square. The god blinked muzzily. This was nearly as bad as the eagles. It was nearly as bad as the cellar. No, perhaps nothing was as bad as the cellar. He caught a few words before another passing foot kicked him away. A drought has been on our village for three years. A little rain, oh lord? Rotating on the top of his shell, he vaguely wondered if the right answer might stop people kicking him. The great god uttered, or muttered, no problem. Another foot bounced him, unseen by any of the pious, between the forest of legs. The world was a blur. He caught an ancient voice steeped in hopelessness, saying, Lord, Lord, why must my son be taken to join your divine legion? Who now will tend to the farm? Could you not take some other boy? Eh, don't worry about it, squeaked Ohm. A sandal caught him under his tail and flicked him several yards across the square. No one was looking down. It was generally believed that staring fixedly at the golden horns of the temple roof while uttering the prayer gave it added potency. Where the presence of the tortoise was dimly registered as bang on the ankle, it was disposed of by an automatic prod of the other foot. My wife, who is sick with the right kick, make clean our well in the village, which is foul with you got it kick. Every year the locusts come, and I promise only lost upon the seas in these five months. Stop kicking me. The tortoise landed right side up in a brief, clear space, visible. So much of animal life is the recognition of pattern, the shapes of the hunter and hunted. To the casual eye, the forest is, well, just a forest. And to the eye of the dove, it is so much unimportant fuzzy green background to the hawk, which you did not notice on the branch of a tree. To the tiny dot of the hunting buzzard in the heights, the whole panorama of the world is just a fog compared to the scurrying prey in the grass. From his perch on the horns themselves, the eagle leapt into the sky. Fortunately, the same awareness of shapes that made the tortoise so prominent in a square full of scurrying humans made the tortoise's one eye swivel upward in dread anticipation. Eagles are single-minded creatures. Once the idea of lunch is fixed in their minds, it tends to remain there until satisfied. There were two divine legionaries outside of Vorbis's quarters. They looked sideways at Brutha as he knocked timorously at the door, as if looking for a reason to assault him. A small gray priest opened the door and ushered Brutha into a small, barely furnished room. He pointed meaningfully at a stool. Brutha sat down. The priest vanished behind a curtain. Brutha took one glance around the room and... Blackness engulfed him before he could move, and Brutha's reflexes were not well coordinated at the best of times. A voice by his ear said, Now, brother, do not panic. I order you not to panic. There was a cloth in front of Brutha's face. Just nod, boy. Brutha nodded. They put a hood over your face. All the novices knew that. Stories were told that the, in the dormitories. They put a cloth over your face so the inquisitors didn't know who they were working on. Good. Now we're going to the next room. Be careful where you tread. Hands guided him upright and across the floor. Through the mist of incomprehension, he felt the brush of the curtain and then was jolted down some steps into a sandy-floored room. The hands spun him a few times, firmly but without apparent ill will, and then led him along a passageway. There was a swish of another curtain, and then the indefinable sense of a larger space. After, afterward, a long afterward, Brutha realized there was no terror. A hood had been slipped over his head in the room of the head of the Inquisition, and it never occurred to him to be terrified, because he had faith. There is a stool behind you. Be seated. Brutha sat. You may remove the hood. Brutha removed the hood. He blinked. Seated on the stools at the far end of the room, with a holy legionary on either side of them, were three figures. He recognized the aquiline face of Deacon Vorbis. The other two were short and stocky men, and a very er, a short and stocky man and a very fat one. Not heavily built like Brutha, but a genuine lard tub. All three wore plain gray robes. There were no sign of any branding irons or even of scalpels. All three were staring intently. Novice Brutha, said Vorbis. Brutha nodded. Vorbis gave a light laugh, the kind made by a very intelligent people when they think of something that probably isn't very amusing. <sighs> and of course, one day we shall have to call you Brother Brutha, he said, or even Father Brutha. Rather confusing, I think. Best to be avoided. I think we shall have to see to it that you become Subdeacon Brutha just as soon as possible. 
What do you think of that? Brutha did not think anything of it. He was vaguely aware that advancement was being discussed, but his mind had gone blank. Anyway, enough of this, said Forbus, with the slight exasperation of someone who realizes that he is going to have to do a lot of work in this conversation. Do you recognize these learned fathers on my left and right? Brutha shook his head. Good, they have some questions to ask you. Brutha nodded. The very fat man leaned forward. Do you have a tongue, boy? Brutha nodded, and then, feeling that perhaps this wasn't enough, presented it for inspection. Vorbis laid a restraining hand on the fat man's arm. I think our young friend is a little overawed, he said mildly. He smiled. Now, Brutha, please put it away. I am going to ask you some questions. Do you understand? Brutha nodded. When you first came into my apartments, you were for a few seconds in the anteroom. Please describe it to me. Brutha stared frog-eyed at him, but the turbines of recollection ground into life without his volition, pouring their words into the forefront of his mind. It is a room about three meters square with white walls. There is sand on the floor except in the corner by the door where the flagstones are visible. There is a window on the opposite wall about two meters up. There were three bars in the window. There's a three-legged stool. There's a holy icon of the prophet Ossery carved from a fascia wood and set with silver leaf. There's a scratch in the bottom left-hand corner of the frame. There's a shelf under the window. There's nothing on the shelf but a tray. Vorbis steepled his long, thin fingers in front of his nose. On the tray? He said. I'm sorry, my lord. What was on the tray, my son? Images whirled in front of Brutha's eyes. On the tray was a thimble, a bronze thimble, and two needles. On the tray was a length of cord. There were knots in the cord, three knots, and nine coins were on the tray. There was a silver cup on the tray, decorated with a pattern of aphasia leaves. There was a long dagger, I think it was steel, with a black handle with seven ridges in it. There was a small piece of black cloth on the tray. There was a stylus and a slate. Tell me about the coins, murmured Vorbis. Uh, three of them were citadel scents, said Brutha promptly. Two were showing the horns and one the sevenfold crown. Four of the coins were very small and golden. The lettering on them, which, which I could not read, but uh, which if you were to give me a stylus, I think I could. Is this some sort of trick, said the fat man? I assure you, said Vorbis, the boy could have seen the entire room for no more than a second. Brutha, tell us about the other coins. The other coins were large. They were bronze. They're, uh, direct me from a phoebe. How do you know this? They are hardly common in the Citadel. I have seen them once before, Lord. When was this? Brutha's face screwed up with effort. I'm not sure, he said. The fat man beamed at Vorbis. Ha! He said. I think, said Brutha, it was in the afternoon, but it may have been in the morning, around midday, on Groom Third, in the year of the astounded beetle, some merchants came into our village. How old were you at that time? said Vorbis. I was within one month of three years old, Lord. I don't believe this, said the fat man. Brutha's mouth opened and shut once or twice. How did the fat man know? He hadn't been there. You could be wrong, my son, said Vorbis. You are a well-grown lad of, what, 17, 18 years? We feel you could not really recall a chance glimpse of a foreign coin 15 years ago. <laughs> we think that you're making it up, said the fat man. Brutha said nothing. Why make anything up when it was just sitting there in his head? Can you remember everything that's ever happened to you, said the stocky man, who'd been watching Brutha carefully throughout the exchange. Brutha was glad of the interruption. Uh, no, Lord, most things. Uh, you forget things? Uh, there are some things I don't remember. Ruth had heard about forgetfulness, although he found it hard to imagine. But there were times in his life, in the first few years of his life especially, when there was nothing. Not an attrition of his memory, but great locked rooms in the mansion of his recollection. Not forgotten any more than a locked room ceased to exist, but locked. What is the first thing you can remember, my son? There was a bright light, and then someone hit me, said Brutha. The three men stared at him blankly. Then they turned to one another. Brutha, through the misery of his terror, heard snatches of whispering. Those are to lose, foolish and probably demonic. Stakes are high. One chance and they will be expecting us.
and so on. He looked around the room. Furnishing was not a priority in the citadel. Shelves, stools, tables. There was a rumor among the novices that priests towards the top of the hierarchy had golden furniture, but there was no sign of it here. The room was as severe as anything in the novices' quarters, uh, although it had, perhaps, a more opulent severity. It wasn't the forced bareness of poverty, but the starkness of intent. My son? Brutha looked back hurriedly. Vorbis glanced at his colleagues. The stocky man nodded. The fat man shrugged. Brutha, said Vorbis, return to your dormitory now. Before you go, one of the servants will give you something to eat and a drink. You will report to the Gate of Horns at dawn tomorrow, and you will come with me to a Phoebe. You know about the delegation to a Phoebe. Uh, Prutha shook his head. Perhaps there is no reason why you should, said Vorbis. We are going to discuss political matters with the tyrant. Do you understand? Prutha shook his head. Good, said Vorbis. Very good. Oh, and Brutha? Uh, yes, Lord? You will forget this meeting. You have not been in this room. You have not seen us here. Brutha gaped at him. This was nonsense. You couldn't forget things just by wishing. Some things forgot themselves, the things in those locked rooms. But that was because of some mechanism he could not access. What did this man mean? Yes, Lord, he said. It seemed the simplest way. Gods have no one to pray to. The great god Ohm scurried towards the nearest statue, neck stretched, inefficient legs pumping. The statue happened to be himself as a bull, trampling an infidel, although this was of no great comfort. It was only a matter of time before the eagle stopped circling and swooped. Om had been a tortoise for only three years, but with that, the shape he had inherited a grab bag of instincts, and a lot of them centered around a total terror of one wild creature that had found out how to eat tortoise. Gods have no one to pray to. Om really wished this was not the case, but everyone needs someone. Brutha! Brutha was a little uncertain about his immediate future. Deacon Vorbis had clearly cut him loose from his chores as a novice, but he had nothing to do for the rest of the afternoon. He gravitated towards the garden, and there were beans to tie up, and he welcomed that fact. You knew where you were with beans. They didn't tell you to do impossible things like forget. Besides, if he was going to be away for a while, he ought to mulch the melons and explain things to Lut Z. Lut Z came with the gardens. Every organization had someone like him. They might be pushing a broom in obscure corridors, or wandering among shelves in the back of the stores, any where they are the only person who knows where anything is, or have some ambiguous but essential relationship with the boiler room. Everyone knows who they are, and no one remembers at a time when they weren't there, or knows where they go when they're not, well, where they usually are. Just occasionally, people who are slightly more observant than most people, which is not on the face of it's very difficult, stop and wonder about them for a while and then get on with something else. Strangely enough, given his gentle ambling from garden to garden around the citadel, Lut Z never showed much interest in the plants themselves. He dealt in soil, manure, muck, compost, loam, and dust, and the means of moving it about. Generally, he was pushing a broom or turning over a heap. Once anyone put seeds in anything, he lost interest. He was raking the paths when Brutha entered. He was good at raking paths. He left scallop patterns and gentle, soothing curves, Ruth always felt apologetic about walking over them. He hardly ever spoke to Lutzi because it didn't matter how much what anyone ever said to Lutzi. The old man just nodded and smiled his single tooth smile in any case. I'm going to be going away for a little while, said Brutha, loudly and distinctly. I expect someone else would be sent to look after the gardens, but there are some things that need doing. Nod, smile. The old man followed him patiently along the rows while Brutha spoke beans and herbs. Understand, said Brutha, after ten minutes of this. Nod, smile, nod, smile, beckon. What? Nod, smile, beckon, nod, smile, beckon, smile. Lutzi walked his little crab monkey walk to the little area at the far end of the walled garden which contained his heaps, the flower pot stacks, and all other cosmetics of the garden beautiful. The old man slept there, Brutha suspected. Nod, smile, beckon. There was a small trestle table in the sun by a stack of bean canes. A straw mat had been spread on it, and on the mat were half a dozen pointy-shaped rocks, none of them bigger than a foot high. A careful arrangement of sticks had been constructed around them. Bits of thin wood shadowed some parts of the rocks. Small metal mirrors directed sunlight towards other areas. Paper cones at odd angles appeared to be funneling the breeze to very precise points. 
Rutha had never heard of the art of bonsai and how it was applied to mountains. They're, uh, very nice, he said uncertainly. Nod, smile, pick up a small rock, smile, urge, urge. Oh, I really couldn't take. Urge, urge, grin, nod. Rutha took the tiny mountain. It had a strange, unreal heaviness. To his hand, it felt like a pound or so, but in his head, it weighed thousands of very, very small tons. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Nod, smile, push away politely. It's, uh, very mountainous. Nod, grin. Uh, that can't really be snow on the top, can? Uh, Brutha! His head jerked up, but the voice had come from inside. Oh no, he thought wretchedly. He pushed the little mountain back into Lutzi's hands. But, uh, you keep it for me, uh, yes? Brutha! Oh, that was a dream, wasn't it? Before I was important and talked to by deacons. No, it wasn't! Help me! The petitioner scattered as the eagle made a pass over the place of lamentation. It wheeled only a few feet above the ground and perched on the statue of Great Ohm trampling in the infidel. It was a magnificent bird, golden brown and yellow eyed, and it surveyed the crowds with blank disdain. It's a sign, said an old man with a wooden leg. Yes, a sign, said a young woman next to him. A sign! They gathered around the statue. It's a bugger, said the small and totally unheard voice from somewhere around their feet. But what's it a sign of, said an elderly man who had been camping out of the square for three days. What do you mean of? It's a sign, said the wooden-legged man. It doesn't have to be a sign of anything. That's a suspicious kind of question to ask. What's it a sign of? Gotta be a sign of something, said the elderly man. That's a referential boss name. A, a garand. It could be a garand. A skinny figure appeared at the edge of the group, moving serotipious surreptitiously, yet with surprising speed. It was wearing a, um, Dejelaba, I don't know it, some kind of clothing, of the desert tribes, but around its neck was a tray on a strap. There was an ominous suggestion of sticky sweet things covered in dust. It could be a messenger from the great god himself, said the woman. It's a bloody eagle is what it is, said a resigned voice from somewhere along the ornamental bronze homicide at the base of the statue. Dates? Figs? Sherberts? Holy relics? Nice fresh indulgences? Lizards? On a stick? Said the man with the tray, hopefully. I thought when he appeared in the world, it was going to be a swan or a bull, said the wooden-legged man. Ha! Said the unregarded voice of the tortoise. No, always uh, wondered about that, said a young novice at the back of the crowd. You know, well, swans a bit lacking in machismo, yes? May you be stoned to death for your blasphemy, said the woman hotly. The great God hears every irreverent word you utter. Ha! From under the statue. And the man with the tray oiled further, forward a little further, saying, Clatchy and delight, honeyed wasps, get them while they're cold. That's the point, though, said the elderly man in a kind of boring, unstoppable voice. I mean, there's something very godly about an eagle, king of birds, am I right? It's only a better-looking turkey, said the voice from this statue, brain the size of a walnut. Hmm. Very noble, too, the eagle. Intelligent, too, said the elderly man. Interesting fact, eagles are the only birds to work out how to eat tortoises, you know? They pick them up, flying very high, drop them onto the rocks, smashes them right open. Amazing. One day, said a dull voice from down below, I'm going to be back on form again, and you're going to be very sorry you said that. For a very long moment, I might even go so far as to make even more time just for you to be sorry in. Or, no, I'll make you a tortoise. Yeah, you like it, eh? That rushing wind around your shell, the ground getting bigger the whole time. That'd be an interesting fact. That sounds dreadful, said the woman, looking up at the eagle's glare. I wonder what passes through the poor little creature's head when he's dropped. His shell, madam, said the great god Ohm trying to squeeze himself even further under the bronze, bronze overhang. The man with the tray was looking dejected. Tell you what, he said. Two bags of sugar dates are the price of one. How about that? And that's cutting my own hand off. The woman looked at the tray. Eh, there's flies all over everything, she said. Uh, currants, madame. Why'd they all just fly away then, the woman demanded. The man looked down. Then he looked back up into her face. 
miracle, he said, waving his hands dramatically. The time of the miracle is at hand. The eagle shifted uneasily. It recognized humans as only pieces of mobile landscape, which, in the lambing season of the high hills, might be associated with thrown stones when it stooped on upon the newborn lamb, but which otherwise were as unimportant as, in the scheme of things as bushes or rocks. But it had never been so close to so many of them. Its mad eyes swiveled backwards and forwards uncertainly. At that moment, trumpets rang out across the place. The eagle looked around wildly, its tiny predator mind trying to deal with the sudden overload. It leapt into the air. The Warpishers fought to get out of its way as it dipped across the flagstones and then rose majestically towards the turrets of the Great Temple and the hot sky. Below at the doors of the Great Temple, each one made of 40 tons of gilded bronze, opened by the breath, it was said, of the great god himself, swung open ponderously and, this was the holy part, silently. Brutha's enormous sandals flapped and flapped on the flagstones. Brutha always had to put a lot of effort into running. He ran from the knees, lower legs thrashing like paddle wheels. This was too much. There was a tortoise who said he was a god, and this couldn't be true except that it must be true because of what it knew, and he'd been tried by the Quisition, or something like that. Anyway, it hadn't been as painful as he'd been led to expect. Brutha! The square, normally alive with the sir... Ciceration of a thousand prayers had gone quiet. The pilgrims had all turned to face the temple. His mind boiling with the events of the day, Brutha shouldered his way through the si suddenly silent crowd. Brutha! People have reality dampers. It is a popular fact that nine-tenths of the brain is not even used, and like most popular facts, it is wrong. Not even the most stupid creator would go to the trouble of making the human head carry around several pounds of unnecessary gray goo if its only real purpose was, for example, to serve as a delicacy for certain remote tribesmen in unexplored valleys, it is used, and one of its functions is to make the miraculous seem ordinary and turn the unusual into the usual. Because if this was not the case, then human beings, faced with the daily wondrousness of everything, would go around wearing big stupid grins similar to those worn by certain remote tribesmen who occasionally get raided by the authorities and have contents of their plastic greenhouses very seriously inspected. They'd say, wow, a lot, and no one, would go, no one would do much work. Gods don't like people not doing much work. People who aren't busy all the time might start to think. Parts of the brain exist to stop this from happening. It's very efficient. It can make people experience boredom in the middle of marvels, and Brutus was working feverishly. So he didn't immediately notice that he pushed through the last row of people and had trotted out into the middle of a wide pathway until he turned and saw the procession approaching. The Cenobiarch was returning to his apartments after conducting, or at least nodding vaguely while his chaplain conducted on his behalf, the evening service. Brutha spun around looking for a way to escape. Then there was a cough beside him, and he stared up into the furious faces of a couple of lesser Iams, and between them, the bemused and geriatrically good-natured expression of the Cenobiarch himself. The old man raised his hand automatically to bless Brutha with the holy horns, then the two members of the Divine Legions picked up the novice by the elbows on the second attempt and marched him swiftly out of the procession's path and hurled him into the crowd. Brutha! Brutha bounded across the plaza to the statue and leaned against it, panting. I'm going to hell, he muttered, for all eternity! Who cares? Now get me away from here! No one was paying him any attention now. They were all watching the procession. Even watching the procession was a holy act. Brutha knelt down and peered into the scrollwork around the base of the statue. All, one beady eye glared back at him. How did you get under there? It was touch and go, said the tortoise. I tell you, when I'm uh, back on form, there's going to be a considerable redesigning of eagles. What's the eagle trying to do to you, said Brutha? It wants to carry me off to its nest and give me dinner, snarled the tortoise. What do you think it wanted to do? There's a short pause in which it contemplated the futility of sarcasm in the presence of Brutha. It was like throwing meringues at a castle. It wants to eat me, it said patiently. But you're a tortoise. I am your god. But currently in the shape of a tortoise, with a shell on, is what I mean. That doesn't worry eagles, said the tortoise, darkly. They pick you up, carry you up a few hundred feet, and then drop you. Ugh. No, more like crack, splat. How did you think I got in here? You were dropped? But 
Landed on a pile of dirt in your garden. That's eagles for you. Whole place built of rock, paved with rock and big rock, and they miss. That was lucky. Million to one chance, said Brutha. I never had this trouble when I was a bull. The number of eagles who can pick up a bull, you can count them on your fingers of one he one's head. Anyway, said the tortoise, there's worse here than eagles. There's a... Um, there's good eating on one of them, you know, said a voice behind Brutha. He stood up guiltily, the tortoise in his hand. Oh, hello, Mr. Deblah, he said. Everyone in the city knew cut me own hand off Deblah, purveyor of suspiciously new holy relics, suspiciously old rancid sw sweetmeats on a stick, gritty figs, and a long past sell-by dates. He was a sort of natural force, like the wind. No one knew where he came from or where he went at night, but he was there every dawn selling sticky things to the pilgrims. And in this priest's reckoning, he was on t to a good thing, because most of the pilgrims were coming here er, coming for the first time, and therefore lacked the essential thing you needed in dealing with de Blas, which was experience of having dealt with him before. The sight of dignity was a familiar one. Uh, the sight of someone in the place trying to unstick their jaws with dignity was a familiar one. Many a devout pilgrim, after a thousand miles of a perilous journey, was forced to make his petition in sign language. Uh, fancy some sherbet for afters, said Deblas hopefully. Only one cent a glass, and that's cutting me own hand off. Who is this fool, said Ulm. I'm not going to eat it, said Brutha hurriedly. Mm, gonna teach you to do tricks then, said Deblas cheerfully. Look through hoops and that kind of thing. Get rid of him, said Om. Smite him on the head, why don't you? And push the body behind the statue. Shut up, said Brutha, beginning to experience once again the problems that occur when you're talking to someone no one else can hear. And no need to be like that about it. I wasn't talking to you, said Brutha. Talking to the tortoise, were you? said Deblas. Brutha looked guilty. My old mom used to talk to a gerbil, Deblas went on. Pets are always a great help in times of stress and in times of starvation, too, of course. This man is not honest, said Ulm. I can read his mind. Can you? Can I what? He gave Brutha a lopsided look. Anyway, it'll be company on your uh, journey. What journey? To a Phoebe, the secret mission to talk to the infidel. Brutha knew he shouldn't be surprised. News went around the enclosed world of the Citadel like a bushfire after a drought. Oh he said. The journey. They say Freet's going, said Deblas. And that other one, the Eminence Grease. Deacon Vorbis is a very nice person, said Brutha. He has been very kind to me. He gave me a drink. What of? Yeah, never mind, said Deblas. Of course, I wouldn't say a word against him myself, he added quickly. Why are you talking to this stupid person, Alm demanded. He's a friend of mine, said Brutha. I wish he was a friend of mine, said Deblas. Friends like that, you can never have enemies. Can I uh, press you to a candied sultana on a stick? And I think that's where we'll call it for today, because that's about a good hour of reading. But I'm going to try to to make uh, these videos every day or every other day. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here and uh, trying to get back into the reading thing again. So 